This is day three of the March 89 seven day retreat at Springwater. Yesterday we mentioned how the talk flows out of many questions that are asked in meetings, not just questions, but things that are being looked at and discussed. And that may convey to people, particularly if one hasn't been here before, that to come to a good meeting, one has to bring a good question. <coughs> Maybe even staying away because one doesn't have a question. I forgot to say that yesterday. It's not necessary to bring anything to a meeting. coming empty-handed and starting empty-handed. Which doesn't mean you have to come without a question. We're, we're so conditioned to try to sense with the antennae what is it that I'm supposed to do here or any other place and always finding something, what one is supposed to do or not supposed to do. This question has come up in several meetings. In sitting, or walking, I have no question. And I wouldn't know how to raise one. Should I question the way you seem to indicate is what we're doing here? Should I drum up or dredge up a question? Whom, whom is one asking? Again, so habituated, so trained to either do what one is told to do or feel slightly off if one isn't doing what one thinks one, one ought to do. Can all of that be seen, come into awareness? Just as it happens, and nothing needs to be done about it. If the awareness is non-judgmental, it's sufficient. Thinking about it is not awareness. Thinking about it is endless. What I should and shouldn't be doing, what things should or shouldn't be like here, and so forth. But if there's a moment of seeing that this, these thought loops are running. That's not thinking about it, it's seeing it. And if immediately another judgment comes up, I shouldn't be thinking in loops. Or that judgment is seen. Can it end? Can, can the loop end? And one listens again. or not again, afresh. A, a moment of direct listening is, is not the last moment of listening. It's now, it's fresh, it's new. But let's stay with that for a moment. 
sitting quietly, nothing, nothing coming up there. When, as one person put it, I'm just a buzz with energy. Yes, I'm buzzing. Or someone else saying, at times there's really nothing, there's nothing. I'm not saying do this or that at such a moment, but as this is brought up in a meeting, my question is, in this feeling a buzz, is there an experiencer of the buzzing? Is there an experiencer of the nothingness? Someone who has this experience? Not to interpret the question, just to take it as it is put. And look. If there's looking going on, an experiencer of the buzzing means a, an idea of oneself, an image of oneself. The thought saying, I am a buzz with energy, I'm doing pretty well. It's only the first day. It feels like the, the seventh day or something like that. And even if this isn't happening to you right now, it doesn't happen. One can put oneself into this state of mind. With this comes a feeling of being, doing well, maybe pride, whatever. A attachment to this experience and to the experience of buzzing, or of nothingness, or of fullness, of emptiness. <clears throat> no sooner is something experienced, that the mind wants to put it into words to itself, wants to symbolize it in words or feelings, and then react to it in terms of this is great or this is awful. And with that, this moment of nothing, whatever that was, is gone. It's filled now with representation, with putting it into words, thinking about it, feeling about it, reacting to it. It goes on and on and on. It can be very subtle, the way it's put here is very gross, so that we can all do it together, but it can be very subtle. And as the person uh, told me the next time that we were talking, indeed there was this entity, there was someone there. And in discovering that, it, it exploded away, it was gone. It was a completely different way of being. We're so accustomed to the, the habits of the thought and feeling reaction that it's very difficult to become aware of it. Because it's so customary, so taken for granted, and so much attached to. It gives one a feeling of familiarity and security. To think and feel in certain ways. So someone writes about it or gives a talk, and one listens. And if one listens openly without resistance, without opposition or fight, just listens, then maybe what has been so customary or so taken for granted suddenly springs into view by itself to a mind that is open, not trying to run away or preserve idea, ideal, and image of oneself. In the feeling that there's nothing going on at the moment, can one also 
wonder what that feeling is, that state. And it's very difficult not to become analytical about it, meaning the, this wondering, triggering the, the intellect to begin thinking about it. Because that's not what we're talking about. Let me say, though, that if there is an urgency to think about what is going on, not to control that or inhibit it, to proceed with it, it's not that one thing is right and the other is wrong, but can one be aware that this is what's going on when is thinking something through, asking questions and answering intellectually, to be aware of that and not to feel that it's, it is inappropriate. But right now, in asking what is this state that I'm calling nothing, if I, if I ask this question, I have to be quiet, having asked it. Because I want to, I don't want to think about it, right? I want to get in touch with this directly, with what's going on. I don't, I don't buy it that it's nothing. I'm, I'm opening up to finding out what this is. And I may find, to my surprise, that there's control going on, thought control. Some repressive mechanism of thought or feeling or emotion, which I've learned over the years, guided by the idea that the mind should empty itself, that there's some intrinsic value in the empty mind. And again, an image of having that empty mind, or yeah, sitting without thought. or feeling nothing is going on can, can mean a, a lack of stimulation. People say, there's nothing going on, I feel bored. That's a different kind of nothingness. It's not the result of control. It's, it's wanting, wanting some kind of stimulation that one usually gets uh, in one's daily life through talking or looking at pictures and, and listening to music or drinking coffee or whatever one may be doing to get something going in this organism which is so overstimulated since we've been little. I think we're more and more stimulated than it used to be in, in olden times where there was not much going on in terms of entertainment. So this state of boredom or, or lack, can, can curiosity wonder what, what this is all about? Not trying to provide the stimulation through uh, imagination and fantasy, being intensely interested in this state which we call boredom. And the first thing that has to go is the word boredom, because it has so many implications. And it hides all, all descriptive labels. Stop inquiry. This is fear, this is desire, this is boredom. And we've said it and we know it, because we know the word and its associates, its associations in the mind with what I know fear to be, what I remember desire to be, and what I have known forever boredom to be. So in wondering 
about this present state. I won't call it boredom, even though I've called it a moment ago, but the word can go. And here, there is this whatever it is. What is it? Can one listen? Listen openly and interestedly. Not make something out of it. Feel the temptation to do that, to explain it, to maybe be poetic about it or whatever. Abstain from making anything out of this and remain open in feeling, listening, looking, call it what you will. And the state will reveal itself, it will show itself. Or, as may come up, one doesn't know really what it is. One has no words for it. And yet, because one has no words for it and doesn't know, one is in touch with what one doesn't know. And in this, in, in touchness out of not knowing, out of the openness of not knowing, nothing remains fixed. Things change. It isn't the same state anymore that it was a moment ago when I named it and knew it and resisted it or hated it or clung to it, trying to keep it and perpetuate it. In thought and image, the, the desire to get rid of or keep is always connected with thought and idea. Maybe very fleeting, but there it is. I don't want this. I hope this will last. And then one isn't in touch with what's really going on, but in touch with one's desire or fear. Thoughts. Please, if this isn't clear, bring it up. We'll, we'll start over in a meeting. <clears throat> question of desire and fear comes up all the time. Desire arising during sitting or walking. And what to do with this desire? Usually the feeling in a retreat is I would like to be rid of it. I don't like that. This is an impediment. Same with fear. If I only would overcome my fear, I would, I would be able to sit better. Or feel better, happier. But again we're asking, what is fear? What is desire? Not philosophically, not psychologically, from one's knowledge. What one has learned about it, studied about it, and remembers from the past. But as it actually happens here. It's a tremendous opportunity to be in touch with something that's live, not dead in the books. And to observe or be in touch with desire, it's very important not to want to get rid of it condemn it or have a religious or whatever ideas about the uh, what, what, undesirability of desire. Because as one desires to get rid of desire, there is just a different desire at work. And nothing is understood. So, is it possible in a silent environment, sitting quietly, to watch the arising of desire. 
how that operates. And start by not knowing anything about it. Not knowing whether it starts physically or mentally, but, but to watch it. What is reported mostly is either seeing an attractive person or imagining an attractive person. Let's remain with seeing some, seeing an attractive person, mentally or directly. What happens? Does, does one remain with a seeing? Is there just seeing that person as he or she walks, dresses, moves, eats, sits? Because if, there's, if they were just seeing that person, would there be the arising of desire for that person, to be with that person? That one just sees it and nothing else. But what, what actually does happen in seeing an attractive person? Fantasy, imagination begins to operate. Seeing this person with me, me and this person. Together doing this or that. And with the, the with thought, imagination, fantasy coming in, the arousal of desire for, for that person. Can one see that for oneself? Or will at the moment of seeing someone attractive, either in the fantasy or in, uh, directly here, will one negate all attention and go with the, with the good feelings of desire, the pleasure of it? If one is very concerned about finding out about desire, what will one do? One doesn't know. One has, to, one has to see. Of course, what was just said about uh, desire for a person, sexual feelings, the same as with food. As there is the feeling of boredom, the lack of stimulation, maybe close to a mealtime, maybe not. But maybe fragrance of freshly baked bread wafting through this room. Can, can one just smell it? And also feel the, what we just went, went through, the feeling of wanting or shakiness, maybe the low blood sugar level, pang, uh, hunger pangs in the stomach, can one just be with what's factually there? The fragrance of the meal, the hunger pangs, or the feeling of boredom, one doesn't call it boredom, but, but whatever that feeling is, and remain with what's actually going on, or will fantasy take over immediately of seeing the bread in front of one, slices and slices and slices, <coughs> eating it and eating the food with it and, and so forth. And with that, the, the mouth begins to salivate and this desire for food is in, in, in full progress. And not to assume that this is inevitable, to question whether it's possible to remain with the, with the actual facts of, of the organism and the, the fragrances and so forth. This 
This requires a great deal of attention. The energy gathered in attending to what is going on. And not the tremendous yearning for, for having a pleasurable experience. If that is overpowering, then there will be no observation. There will be just going with fantasy or whatever one, one needs to do, yearns to do to get a sensation of pleasure. And as we all know, fantasy can provide almost as much pleasurable sensations as the real thing. Because all of the past sensations, emotions, feelings have been recorded in memory and can be evoked by memory. So as one sits and feels bored, is that what the mind habitually does? Evoke pleasurable fantasies to feel better, happy, stimulated, to feel alive which we're not condemning, we're just looking at it. And we're seeing that evoking fantasies to feel stimulated and alive is not the same thing as looking at this state of, of boredom, feeling of wanting, insufficiency or loneliness, the pain of it. Again, one could say it's a very drab thing to look at the feeling of loneliness rather than indulge in the fantasy, and that's true. The fantasy is much more vivid. But has one ever, ever tried to look into loneliness, to, to really meet it so completely? What is it? And again, putting the word loneliness aside, one doesn't know it. If one says loneliness, one already knows and remembers from the past how achy and awful it is. And it shouldn't be, and there should be something else. But here, in, in a quiet place where, where all of us are engaged in this work of listening and looking and fantasizing, can one wonder about, for once, being completely with loneliness or whatever the problem may be at the time? Pain, fear, fear, guilt. Several people have said to me, I hear what you're saying, but I can't bring it off myself to inquire. What, what do you mean by inquiring? I, sort of start it and then I get stuck. I don't really know how to do it. Which is good. Not, don't know how to do it. Just wonder about what fear is and start, as we're doing right now, to put the word aside. Not stay with the word fear. Then what is there? Because all the thoughts of I may lose my job, or I may lose my companion. He or she may leave me or die. I may die myself and not be with my children anymore. I may get old. I may never be able to see. Or, in doing this work, maybe my feelings of security are being threatened. I'm afraid of that. All the many things we, we've just listed, and there are infinitely more things that can arouse fear. How, how did fear get aroused, whatever we call fear? How did it start? Usually we're, we start noticing when we feel very uncomfortable physically. Crampy in the intestines and queasy in the stomach. And 
tense in the muscles, the heart beating too fast or uncomfortably, the breath not being even. That's when we begin to notice that something is awry and we call it fear. People ask me this, does fear always start with a thought? Because I don't know what started this fear. But one can begin to watch how thoughts about losing someone or losing something arouses fear, arouses these feelings and sensations and emotions throughout the body. It may not be a very clear thought, it may some, be some hazy memory, maybe something one sees triggers a memory and that triggers these feelings of fear. But it's always some memory involved. Memory of something that was and of something that could happen. I wouldn't be afraid of something that can happen if I didn't know. Through past reading, talking, experiencing what all could happen. If that knowledge is not yet deposited in the brain, I wouldn't be afraid. That's why little children, in many instances, are very fearless. Because they don't know yet what, what danger is. The deposits happen very quickly. Because this, this brain is there to protect the organism, to survive. But coming back to fear, we don't want to get too far afield. What is fear? As, as I, I'm now being aware of it. Didn't catch it how it started, but now it's in full swing. What is it? And, and as it were, being climbing into it, being completely in touch with it. Which means no fear to, to face fear. If I'm afraid of facing it, I can't face it. It's like going out on a limb or to, to be with this, which has haunted me all my life. So it's really not so risky. Continuing to live without facing it is the risk, is the real risk. Not meeting it completely. And all kinds of thoughts and images may, may bubble up in the process if there's no resisting it or wanting to get rid of it. Just, uh, you know, there is so much space in this universe. There's infinite space in this whole universe. And there's enough space for this fear to spread out and show itself. By spreading out, I don't mean fueling it with more thoughts, but allowing it to be there without resistance. And watching, seeing it, listening to it. Not as someone separate who evaluates it and has attitudes toward it, but as no one. Do you know what I mean? That there is bare attention not in order to get something out of this. If that motive is there, can it be seen and, and dissipate? So one comes to a point where the listening and what is listened to are not two different things, not two, not, not two different movements, it's one movement Not, I'm attending to that, but what is it? And quietly listening. Not knowing what it is. Knowing puts an end to the, to the open mind of questioning.
then something reveals itself for what it is, that's it. That's that. It's clear. That's what it is. That's seeing. That's not knowing. there too. Vita, 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 Vita. Several questions were asked about pain and posture. Whether one, pos whether one posture, like lytic sitting, cross-legged is superior to sitting with the legs back, maybe kneeling on cushions or on a bench, or sitting on a chair. This is this we have to experiment with ourselves. Sometimes if one has to sit on a chair because one has an injured knee, never given a talk sitting on a chair, and finding out is, is no problem. But again, it merits looking at is one already indoctrinated with the, the supreme posture being folding the legs in this way and a little bit less supreme posture, folding the legs a little bit less. This, these thoughts and ideas have a tremendous power and one may not sit as well kneeling because one has heard that this is an inferior posture. So. One notice all the ideas one has about what one is doing and discard them, start fresh from scratch. There's a great relief when legs are, or joints are sore to, to change the posture. As to the hands, there's also been learning going on and being indoctrinated with a certain posture. One has been trained in Zen, there's this posture, the one palm on top of the other with the thumbs slightly touching. And that, that, that this is the posture in which to meditate, to do zazen. One can, can one be free to question that by experimenting with it? One person told me that he did and it was amazing to find how much idea and narrowness had been tied up in keeping the hands this way. There's the, the idea of the strength of, of the Zen person or whatever one has held on to. This person said, oh, suddenly there was so much more gentleness and just folding the hands naturally. And in all of our ideas and living up to these ideas and upholding these ideas, energy is locked, locked. Which, which only becomes evident when the idea is questioned and the energy begins to flow. The blocked energies is available. 
Until then, one insists because thoughts and ideas also generate energy, even though the, something is blocked. The, the energy that is generated by thoughts and ideas is a very limited one, always needing to be rekindled and always exhausting itself. It is a need of the idea to, to maintain itself. And yet the, the general flow of living, which is without image or idea, that's blocked when we become attached to seeing ourselves as this or that. And there's such fear of letting go of these structures that we have built up which give us good feelings and energy. So can one listen to what's going on inside and out, openly, subtly, not hunting for something. What is there will reveal itself if the mind is not holding on for fear of losing. But you could say, how, how can I be aware of holding on? I don't know how. There's no how. There's only awareness. It happens on its own. That's the marvelous thing. It is something that has no cause. We can assign causes to it and then practice these causes. But that's thought. Here comes to mind what someone said. As soon as I enter this building almost, when I come to retreat, I feel I have to try to be attentive now. And only recently noticing the, the pressure of that, the tenseness that it brings in its wake. I have to be attentive. And unfortunately, so much talk, one one hour a day, and maybe during meetings about attention, conveys this feeling, you must be attentive. But I'm not saying that. We must be nothing. We, we don't must be. We usually think we must be. That's our conditioning. And everything is being drawn into this realm of thinking, I must. So can can one come upon this compulsive thought, I must be attentive, and just see it. Do nothing about it. Let the, let the intelligence of awareness act, which it does, on its own. In freeing from compulsion, once it's seen. Unfortunately, the the small mind of machinations and manipulations thinks that it has to do something about what was seen. Remember it or try to see what happened before and do that again. Can, can one relax? Can that small mind of manipulation and machination relax? Realizing that it can't do anything that's new and fresh. Whatever it tries to do is more of the same. Adding to more of the same tension, pressure, conflict. When that's realized, can there be a, a relaxing in, into not knowing what to do about anything and therefore just 
openly listening like a child. feeling comes up. I can't let go of what is my security. Then what is one's security? What one is holding on is one's prison, onto is one's prison. Don't take my word for it. Find out for yourself by listening and looking without knowing. We will end here for today.